World War II began brewing when Germany was seeking more power and began invading surrounding countries. German leader Adolf Hitler made alliances with Japan and Italy, and they were referred to as the Axis. The United States didn't want to have to go to war if they didn't need to, but on December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, and that pushed President Franklin D. Roosevelt to declare war on Japan, and then three days later, Hitler declared war on the United States. Once the United States went to war, the country jumped to the call. Men enlisted to fight and women went to work in factories to produce supplies and weapons. Americans learned to live their lives without the luxuries they were accustomed to so that anything extra could be used to support the war. Things like tires and gasoline were rationed and even food like sugar and meat. Most of the fighting in World War II took place in Europe. Slowly, Germany invaded and took over France, Belgium, Poland, Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And then Japan began invading China and islands in the Pacific Ocean. Great Britain fought hard to help protect these countries, but they needed more help. The United States formed an alliance with Great Britain, and both countries fought together. After years of fighting, the United States and Great Britain were ready to finally break Hitler's hold on Europe and end his tyranny. A giant invasion was planned with 2 million U.S. and British troops, 4,000 ships, and 11,000 aircraft. They landed on the beaches of Normandy, France. This was called D-Day. It took a few weeks, but eventually, the German forces that were occupying France were defeated. Through more battles and fighting, German forces and their allies were pushed back into Germany. Germany formally surrendered on May 8, 1945. The war in Europe was over. But what about the war with Japan in Asia? President Truman, who took office after President Roosevelt, had a difficult decision to make. Scientists had developed a powerful bomb that could kill tens of thousands of people, and it would easily end the war with Japan. President Truman tried to end the war peacefully with Japan, but they wouldn't surrender. It was a hard choice, but President Truman ordered that atomic bombs be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. The bombs killed over 100,000 people and forced Japan to surrender. This ended World War II on September 2nd, 1945. All right, a little short little video there, of course, on World War II. Uh, of course, I'll be, of course, talking about that subject today and, of course, next week, uh, of course, because we're getting you know pretty much up into like the 1940s uh, right now. So I want to welcome you back, of course, to uh, History 2023. Um, I guess everybody didn't get affected much by the hurricane, um, kind of bypasses a little bit to the east towards New Orleans. But anyway, um, I just want to get going here today. Um, I am streaming to uh, multiple sites today starting. Uh, of course, I'm um, still doing Facebook Live, but I'm also have, have got a, another YouTube link going uh, if anybody wants to watch live uh, when I record this lecture here. Uh, so I have, I have put that up. Uh, if anybody, of course, wants to come in the stream yard, you can. Also, as well, there's a link to it. Uh, or you can also watch, like I said, on YouTube or Facebook Live uh, if you want to watch that. Except Facebook Live, you need to send me a uh, friend request if you want to join my BRCC Facebook page, you know, if you want to watch it from there. Uh, later, I will be putting this lecture up on my YouTube channel. Um, so the video. So if anybody has any comments, questions, let me know about the lecture. If it's an administrative question. Just email me, of course, during the semester. <clears throat> now, I did want to get started here. A few reminders uh, about assignments. I have pushed some assignment due dates back. Uh, if you haven't seen that yet uh, or not, uh, of course, I can bring up the assignments I've got now, but uh, the main one, of course, is that Canvas quiz number one on World War One. Uh, that, of course, I've pushed the due date back back a couple of days, but you'll have until Saturday, Halloween, October 31st, uh, to get that wrapped up. So hopefully you're getting that finished up because uh, we're you know kind of moving along here. We're kind of getting up to um, the 1940s. Uh, I'll try to have some other Canvas quiz maybe next week possibly. So I'm thinking that'll probably be on something to do with like 
the Great Depression and maybe even World War II. I'll see about that. Uh, of course, then you have second exam. Uh, that's, of course, one of the main things uh, you need to, of course, work on as well. That's due at the end of next week. Uh, so you've got it's like seven or eight days to kind of finish that. That is what the October 29th. So yeah, the October 5th is a Thursday next week. So you've got seven, eight days to wrap that up and get that done. So it's kind of going through some of the assignments you need to be working on. Oh, don't forget about your research paper too as well. That's something you got to work on too, because that's coming due soon, of course, in November. I'll, of course, have, have reminders about that later. But uh, I think if you go to, uh, I don't know if it's in here, but I think if you go to, um, let's see, I can bring it up real quick here. But if you go to assignments, uh, that is due um, November the 10th. So it is coming up pretty soon. Um, so it looks like that's due, looking like it's um, not this Saturday, but the next Saturday. So I hope you're working on that project. Um, and, um, Still, if, you, if you've decided what your paper is going to be on, you know, you need to let me know. I think some students have emailed me, I think most of them, but you know what, what subject you're doing and you haven't emailed me, just let me know, uh, of course, about that. All right, that's pretty much it for announcements. But like I said, today I'm going to, of course, talk about <clears throat> the United States' involvement in the, of course, Second World War, also called World War II as well, which mostly – were involved between 1941 to 1945. Uh, of course, you can see I've got the World War II, National World War II Museum shirt, uh, of course, down in uh, in New Orleans. I don't know if you've ever been to that museum, uh, but it's really nice. Uh, I think it started out as the D-Day Museum, and they expanded it into the World War II Museum. It's got, like, multiple buildings now, of course, now. Uh, but definitely something definitely to go see uh, for sure in Louisiana if you haven't done it already. You know, it's been there for a bunch of years. Uh, and so anyway, um, so we're going to, of course, get into uh, and talk about um, World War II. Like I said, of course, I do have a new PowerPoint slide I've put up uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, World War II itself lasts from 1939 uh, to 1945. So it does last quite a while. Um, it um, lasted about six years, uh, pretty much. But the first year or two, we really didn't get too much in the war. Uh, of course, we I'll get to it later, but the United States pretty much stayed neutral uh, during World War II. Um, in fact, we were in a period of kind of what they call isolationism, I guess you can call it, uh, between like World War I uh, and World War II. And the United States really just didn't want to get involved in European problems or, or world problems. And of course, we had our own problems at home. You know, when the Great Depression, you know, happened, uh, we were kind of more concerned about trying to fix this country uh, here. We didn't really want to get involved uh, too much uh, overseas. And so it kind of, you know, obviously allowed these other powers to kind of rise to power. Uh, they had the League of Nations, but the League of Nations really didn't do much really to stop um, the rise of some of these fascist states I'll get to later, uh, which we'll talk about. So between the wars, kind of go through and talk about some things that the United States did prior to World War II, uh, us getting involved. Well, um, you know, of course, we also, the, like I said, the Great Depression, you know, uh, that was a main reason, of course, why we didn't get involved in World War II later until later. Uh, and, um, yeah, the U.S. was trying to keep out immigrants from the country. That's one of the big things that happened between the wars, world wars uh, overall. Uh, also, we tried to keep out a lot of imported goods as well. And so uh, the United States uh, put a lot of um, quotas on immigration. It's kind of like now they're trying to do that, I think, with these HB1 visas, I think they're called, where they're trying to stop people from coming here replace like India and other uh, so on. And I don't know if they're needed right now because we got enough problems as it is with the COVID and trying to get our economy back. And so maybe we don't need all these people right now, but I guess if the economy 
gets booming again. Looks like the economy is starting to boom again because they're saying that the GDP is up like 33%, you know, from the last quarters, which is pretty good. Uh, and um, yeah, immigration quotas and also put a lot of high tariffs, on a lot of imported goods and all that. And so, yeah, part of why they did this was because of the Great Depression uh, and also a lot of anti-European sentiments. Uh, people were worried about their jobs being taken, uh, you know, by foreigners coming in uh, and all that. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, cheap labor, cheap, cheap salaries, that, you know, wages they're paying people. Uh, so they were kind of fearful of that. Uh, also, uh, they, they didn't like all these non-Protestants coming in, like Italians, Irish Irish Catholics. Uh, of course, a lot of Jews were starting to migrate to the country. They tried to restrict Jews from coming in here. So a lot of Jewish people came to the country like in the late 19th or early 20th century before World War I. Uh, and uh, then also a lot of radical people they wanted to keep out, like anybody that was an anarchist, socialist, communist, they were trying to keep those people out uh, as well uh, and all that. Uh, and um, Congress uh, went further, you know, they created a bunch of immigration quotas. I'll give you two of them up there. One called the Emergency Quota Act 1921. They also have the National Origins Act of 1920. Now, there were several of these, I think three or four of them were passed by Congress in the 1920s. And what they did was it limited the number of immigrants that could come to the United States. It was all based on how many were actually living here in the country uh, at the time, like say Italians or Irish or whoever, Jews or whoever they are, uh, Poles, Polish people or whatever. And uh, they went with like in 1921, I think it was third, it was 3% of the origin. Uh, I think in 1924, they went to 2%. And then in 1929, they went to 1%. So it's almost like nothing, uh, hardly any immigrants coming in. I'll give you an example. I'll put on the on the screen for you. But as an example, 1929, there were 300,000 Italians in America. And only 1% could enter the country in one year or 3,000 people, basically. So it's all based on how many people were in the country at the time. They multiply it times 1%. Uh, basically. So it's like, you know, 200,000 Irish, you know, whatever, same thing, you know, doesn't matter. Um, now, between the wars, of course, I was talking about earlier, it was a war on tariffs, you know, about that throughout the world, like between like Europe and America and other places, uh, they everybody threw up tariff barriers uh, and all of that. And we raised tariffs on thousands of goods uh, from foreign countries, uh, like the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act of 1930, which I've mentioned before. That was something that, of course, happened under Herbert Hoover's administration, which they kept. I think they pretty much kept under FDR. Uh, and um, a lot, a lot, the reason why they raised it, if you remember correctly, was they thought that that had been one of the causes of why the Great Depression happened because of high tariffs. So they thought, hey, low, low, let's lower the tariffs. Hey, that'll fix the problem. And actually, it did the opposite. And actually helped to contribute more to making the Great Depression worse, uh, not just here, uh, but in foreign countries. Like it hurt Latin America, hurt Europe, hurt Asia. Uh, and so it was kind of helped to help cause not just make the Great Depression worse, but I think it helped also cause like World War II later, uh, they think as well. Uh, then, of course, we'll get into, of course, the, the you know causes of World War II. Uh, breaking out, which there's, of course, a lot of those of why World War II broke out. Uh, a lot of it went back to World War I. Uh, the, the problems that were in World War I were never really solved. Uh, like the whole issue of nationalism, you know, had been a big thing that helped cause World War I, well, it helped cause World War II, uh, especially the idea of extreme nationalism with a lot of fascist type, you know, political parties that were developed in Europe and fascism in Asia. Uh, then, of course, the harsh Treaty of Versailles, you know, it also helped to cause the war as well. Uh, if you know, remember correctly, the, the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 had really punished the Germans badly. Uh, they made them pay like 30-something billion in war reparations. They lost their territory, lost all their colonies. Uh, they were blamed for the war. Um, I think they even took a lot of their natural resources, 
uh, from them also as well. Uh, so Germans were really suffering, and Germany went through a bad post-war depression uh, after the war, uh, which eventually allowed the rise of of, the Hit of Hitler and the Nazis uh, to eventually, you know, come to power. Uh, of course, the big thing that happened, you know, in Europe was they had all these different fascist dictators that came to power, like Benito Mussolini in Italy. You had, of course, Adolf Hitler uh, in Nazi Germany uh, that they had. Uh, and um, fascism... Um, you know, like I said, occurred in Europe and Asia. It started really in Italy first, uh, right after World War One. It all, like I said, occurred under Benito Mussolini, who eventually seized power in 1922. Uh, it was either that or the communists take over. I think that was the choice, uh, pretty much in Italy. Uh, same thing in Germany. I think uh, the communists tried to take over Germany at one point, and. Um, he came to power in 1922. Uh, Mussolini, of course, ruled as prime minister uh, from about 1922 to about 1943. Uh, and he, of course, called himself the El Duce, Duce which Duce meant uh, the duke or the leader. Uh, and so over time, he became this uh, totalitarian dictator, uh, you know, kind of like some of these other ones like Hitler and Stalin are. In the stall, like stall in the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, the term fascism evolved from the fact that Mussolini borrowed this ancient Roman symbol you may have heard of called the fasci. The word fasci is a Roman symbol meaning bundle. And uh, it was like a bundle of wooden rods with an ax coming out of it. And it was originally a symbol of um, ancient Roman power uh, and authority. Uh, and so the... Um, Italians, fascists, incorporated into the, the Italian flag and all that because Mussolini was hoping to revitalize uh, Italy into a new power, like a like a new Roman Empire uh, in the Mediterranean Sea and all that. Uh, and so that's that's basically what it was. So Italy became this fascist totalitarian state, you know, that would kind of rearm it and, and try to take over the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and so Mussolini was involved in trying to take over part of North Africa, like Libya, Ethiopia. Uh, when World War II broke out, he would even try to take over like Albania and Greece. Uh, but he was kind of a weaker fascist dictator uh, compared to Adolf Hitler, uh, who later, of course, seized power uh, in, in 1933. Uh, in Germany. Uh, Hitler was originally Austrian, if you know about this. He, of course, had fought in World War I. He was a World War I veteran who fought for Germany. Uh, and after the war, uh, he eventually uh, joined this uh, uh, political party called the German Workers' Party. And he turned into this political party called the uh, NSDAP, which was called for short the Nazi Party, or also the long name if you want. It was originally called the uh, National Socialist German Workers' Party. Uh, and it was an anti-Semitic uh, political party. They hated Jews. Uh, they ranted against the Treaty of Versailles uh, about how harsh it was. They were bitterly also very anti-communist. Anti uh, if you know about it, the fascists are the enemies of the communists, the socialists. You may know that, hopefully for sure. They, they, they don't like each other. Totally opposite of each other, I guess. Uh, and uh, but uh, Hitler had used this Nazi party to gain power uh, in 1933, and um, eventually uh, it would um, it would kind of help revitalize Germany, which it would. Uh, but over time, of course, uh, what would happen is after uh, Hitler became chancellor in 1933, which was chancellor about 12 years, he would basically turn turn um you would turn germany into a totalitarian state uh like you see of course with uh italy uh and um this state of course would be later called um i'll put it on the screen for you but it would later be called they call it nazi germany but of course other people also call it the third reich uh, which would be from 1933 and 1945 uh and they of course are important nazi germany because that's one of the main main powers that would cause World War II to break out uh, in 1939. 
as he would try to take over all of Europe. Uh, over time, Hitler in Nazi Germany became, began rearming Germany. Um, so they rearmed it. Uh, they also began starting around 1936. They began retaking lost territory that they had lost uh, from the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. And so in 1936, if you know about it, the Nazis then marched in. They took over the Rhineland, which is between Germany and uh, what is France. They seized that. 1938, they annexed Austria into the Third Reich. Uh, and then 1938-39, the Nazis then took over Czechoslovakia. Uh, mostly without firing or firing a shot uh, at all. Uh, so uh, the Allies in the West were really weak. Uh, they just weren't very powerful. The, the League of Nations really had no means to really stop uh, Hitler. In fact, uh, uh, Germany, Italy, and even Japan had all dropped out of the League of Nations and refused to be part of it. The United States had kind of started to get into the United Nations, but we were kind of not the uh, the League of Nations. Uh, but we were kind of weary of, of being part of the League of Nations and all that. Um, now, what happened was on September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany then invaded Poland. And so that's what precipitated, uh, which causes basically uh, World War II to break out. Uh, and so two days later, September 3rd, 1939, France and Britain declared war on Germany. And World War II, like I said, would last about six years. It would be one of the bloodiest conflicts in human history, uh, you know, causing about 60 million deaths worldwide. Also caused the Holocaust, if you know about that, that killed about maybe six million Jews uh, in Europe. Uh, and um, the major powers, of course, that would be involved uh, later in World War II. Here, of course, some other slides, if you want to look at them, uh, which are right here. But the major powers... That, that, of course, the Allies will be fighting later will be the so-called Axis powers, as they're called, you know, the Axis powers. And the Axis powers, of course, include mostly, like I said, those three countries, Germany, um, Nazi Germany, Empire of Japan, and, of course, the Kingdom of Italy. So Germany, Italy, Japan. Uh, Allied side, of course, would be Britain, France, Soviet Union, China, and the United States, although France would drop out in 1940 because uh, they were eventually um, defeated by the Germans in 1940. So, yeah, France fell early. They didn't, they didn't stay in the war much. But they had the free French of uh, Charles de Gaulle, I think, fought on, by the way, on the Allied side. So, yeah, just talking about that. and But, yeah, worldwide dictatorships, you know, those are all like the, like the different you know underlying causes I've got up there, of course, uh, on World War II. Yeah, Treaty of Versailles. Extreme nationalism, yeah. Of course, the Depression already talked about, all these dictatorships, American isolationism. And then, of course, I didn't talk about the policy of appeasement, but that was another thing, too, that, that also caused the war. The fact that the European powers like Britain and France wanted to just appease Hitler and, and Mussolini and not really fight him because of the bloody World War I war. They didn't want, to have, they didn't want their men to get killed again, and so... Uh, that's pretty much the cause of why World War II, um, you know, broke out later. So direct cause, obviously, Germany invading Poland, you know, and that's pretty much the reason for, for it breaking out. Now, I'm going to also, um, of course, um, talk about the U.S. Uh, between, the, between the wars, uh, what happened, I need to get into that. Uh, the U.S., of course, um, stayed neutral uh, pretty much. And, um, and so everybody's fighting, you know, a year of their fight, 1939 to 1941. Well, the United States, um, of course, even at one point passed the so-called Neutrality Act of 1939 to try to stay neutral uh, in the war. In fact, there are several of these uh, Neutrality Acts that they passed. Uh, to try to get out of the war. Uh, however, we got drawn in because of the fact that the European powers like Britain needed material A uh, to fight in the war. Uh, and so uh, the U.S. I'll get the U.S. begins even trying to prepare, you know, for the war 
uh, because we realized that we might war might break out any time, you know, with Germany, uh, with even Japan or somebody uh, that's part of the Axis powers. And so there was a case where the United States even tried to enlarge its military. Uh, if you know about this, starting around 1940-41, this was part of the Burke Wadsworth Act. And the Burke Wadsworth Act was a um, peacetime draft they enacted on uh, the United States, uh, which was originally called the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940. It was passed by Congress. And what it did was it forced men that were uh, between the ages of 21 to 35 uh, to register for the local draft boards, uh, you know, in case you know a big war broke out. And they also started drafting men into the military as well. Uh, I think for like one year, I thought I think is what it was. I forget how long it was. Yeah, the train for, but maybe a year or so. Uh, and over time, this uh, draft we're talking about, uh, the Burke, Burke Wadsworth Act, uh, would eventually draft about 10 million American men uh, to fight in the war. And about 400,000 Americans actually died in the war, uh, fighting a war, too. Uh, then also, of course, the United States also gave military aid uh, to Britain and, was in, in, of course, and some of these other powers uh, as well. Uh, and um, FDR called it the arsenal of democracy. He had this idea uh, to send um, arms instead of men you know, to fight against fascism and all that. And so we started with Britain first. We aided them. We aided the Soviet Union. We aided the Chinese, uh, the Free French, I think the Free Polish forces. Uh, anybody that was fighting against the Axis powers, we pretty much gave them military aid, uh, more or less. Uh, the first thing we did in 1939 was that thing up there called the cash and carry policy. That was the first thing that the Americans really did uh, to help out Britain. Uh, Winston Churchill uh, in um, you study about it, was was almost practically fighting alone, uh, especially after France dropped out of you know, the war in 1940. And so one of the first things we did was we came up, Congress came up with this thing called the cash and carry policy. And that's where basically Britain or any other allies that were fighting the Axis powers could actually come over and pick up whatever kind of war materials they needed, you know, for the war effort using their own ships. I think they could have to pay cash. Uh, was what it was. So that was the first initial thing that the United States did uh, to help help the you know allies in the war without actually sending men uh, to actually fight in the war. Now you may have heard of the Lend-Lease Act. That was another thing too uh, that Congress came up with in 1941. Uh, that was a famous program where we lended or leased weapons, material for war. Uh, to the Allied powers, Britain, Soviets, Chinese, et cetera, Free French. Uh, and uh, they were supposed to pay us back later uh, for all this equipment. Uh, and um, see on the bottom there, uh, FDR used to talk about it, and of course, in his so-called fireside chats, which you may have heard of. And um, he kind of compared it to a fire hose, a, a garden hose. Um, and um, he said, oh, hey, if your neighbor's house is on fire, what are you going to do? You're going to um, give him um, a hose to put it out and help him put out the fire. Uh, so that was the idea of what the Lend Lease uh, was, was about. Uh, and however, a lot of the stuff wasn't paid back. You know about this. I don't know if, it, if a lot of it was or not. Uh, but, um, but we do know that the Lend Lease agreement that was made uh, with the other allies to help them out in the war, uh, help draw us in to World War II. Uh, because um, eventually what happened was uh, our ships, which were starting to send all these war materials uh, to the allies, like the Soviets, the British, uh, et cetera, uh, we were getting our ships sunk uh, in the Atlantic Ocean by German submarines, German U-boats, uh, which I think the peak of was 1941-42. Uh, the so-called U-boat war, which Churchill, that was one of the things he was really scared about. So it's kind of like this undeclared war with Hitler we were, we were kind of doing in 1941. Uh, but when, after Japan attacked us, you know, uh, that eventually led, led to us getting in the war. So yeah, that's, that's some of the other slides I've got here. But basically, yeah, the U.S., you know, would basically help all, all these other countries I think it shows here uh, how much money was actually spent uh, to basically um, to help all these foreign 
foreign powers fight against against uh, the Axis powers. Great Britain, 31 billion. Soviet Union, 11 billion. France, 3 billion. China, 1.5 billion. Uh, we even sent aid to South America. So you can see we spent about $48 billion, almost $50 billion, uh, helping all these countries out, uh, trying to fight, of course, uh, fascism. All right, uh, now um, let me also next, of course, move and talk about Japan, uh, what happened. Japan was another threat uh, to the United States uh, as well. Uh, and, um, yeah, you had the rise of fascism in Japan that happened. Japan became an empire uh, between, like, World War One and World War Two, And so uh, direct, direct contract – yeah, a direct, uh, you know, conflict with them uh, eventually led to us going to war uh, in December of 1941. Uh, and a lot of this had to do with the fact that Japan was expanding its empire uh, into Asia. Uh, they they had already occupied Korea uh, before, I think, World War One, uh, and then. They later in the 1930s took over Manchuria, which they created into this uh, puppet state they called M Manchuko. Uh, and then they, in 1937, they even invaded into the Republic of China and tried to take over the eastern part of China and take cities like Beijing, Hong Kong, Nanking. And uh, it, it sparked a long war that was called the Second sino japanese War, which would go on for like close to eight years. Uh, and it was considered, by the way, one of the longest conflicts in World War II. It was also one of the bloodiest. I think it was the second bloodiest conflict in the whole World War II behind the Eastern Front, you know, when the Soviets fought the Germans. But close to 10 million people or more died in China uh, fighting in the war. And um, we later would actually send them uh, aid, military aid. Uh, and also the British also sent them aid uh, as well. So that's kind of like an initial, you know, how that happened. And um, so basically by 1941, the empire of Japan became this major threat to the United States. And so the U.S., um, we became angry over this Japanese aggression uh, that was going on in China, going on in the Pacific, Southeast Asia, uh, also as well. And uh, before the war broke out, I did want to mention a famous story that happened right before Pearl Harbor. That's well known. Uh, before the war broke out, the United States, besides sending military aid to Republic of China, also sent volunteer pilots uh, to go fight with the Chinese Air Force uh, against the Japanese Air Force. And it was called the American Volunteer Group, also known as the so-called AVG. You may have heard of, um, if you're from Louisiana, you may have heard of Claire Chenault. Claire Chenault was a famous uh, American general. Uh, and uh, he actually, uh, I think he's from Texas, like eastern Texas, but he actually went to LSU, Louisiana State University, for a short time. Uh, and uh, he would, of course, lead the Flying T Tigers and form them in 1941. Of course, he named them Flying Tigers after the LSU Tigers, uh, hence the name being used. And uh, they were famous for their uh, aircraft that they would fly called like the P-40 Warhawk, uh, which is well known, which was named, famous for its tiger's teeth uh, that it had. Uh, and uh, there's actually one uh, downtown in Baton Rouge uh, where the USS Kidd Memorial is and all that. I think they got one hanging up uh, that's there. So, um, so that's basically, you know, who they were, uh, the Flying Tigers. Uh, they are, they, later they would become an, um, like an Army Air Corps wing that would help the Chinese uh, in – when we would go to war with Japan and all that later. But they were actually volunteers that went over there um, on all that. So, yeah, I'll put that on the screen if you want to get that later. But there, yeah, there's the information for it. But um, now let's go ahead and move on and talk about, of course, the next thing that happened, of course, uh, in the war. That, of course, is the fact that the Japanese eventually attacked us uh, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, and um, the um, what happened was that because of Japanese aggression in the Pacific, uh, the U.S. eventually – put an embargo on, on Japan uh, to try to force them out of China. 
because uh, we want it, you know, China be a you know a separate state and not being invaded. Uh, and so the United States banned shipments of uh, oil, uh, fuel, steel, any kind of scrap metal uh, that might be used for making bombs and ships and planes. All that was banned uh, from being, of course, shipped to Japan. And uh, of course, it put a big strain on Japan's military because uh, they were, you know, had huge armies that were in mostly in China and parts of Southeast Asia and also in the Pacific. Uh, and so they got pretty angry about this uh, Japan. And so they decided that they were going to retaliate uh, against the United States, which would help, you know, provoke war uh, between uh, the United States and Japan. Uh, and so um, Japan started planning this attack to go after our uh, U.S. Pacific fleet that was based in Hawaii. It was based in Pearl Harbor, which Pearl Harbor, if you know about it, is a natural harbor uh, that's in Oahu, like the little small island where Honolulu is, capital of Hawaii. And so um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which, if you know about it, happened on the famous date of December 7th, 1941, was planned by the Japanese Navy. Uh, back the guy that planned it was Admiral Yamamoto. He was the head of the Imperial Japanese Navy. And the Japanese were hoping for a quick strike on the United States, uh, take out our Pacific fleet, and then that would force the United States uh, to come to terms with the Japanese, to sue for peace, maybe a treaty with them, and then that would basically, we wouldn't fight much of a war. So they were hoping to have it make a quick conflict, uh, more or less, uh, and then out of the war. Uh, I think Yamamoto believed that they could fight us pretty much toe-to-toe -to -toe for about maybe a year, uh, but after that, he said that it would be like waking up a sleeping giant, I think is what he said famously, which turned out to be pretty true. Uh, the Japanese at that point, what they did was uh, by November, they amassed a huge uh, carrier task force. If you know, the Japanese had um, put more emphasis on um, building aircraft carriers because they were limited due to naval treaties from building battleships, which if you know about it before World War II, the main kind of capital ship that most states uh, built were these huge battle wagons or battleships. Uh, that they, they, of course, built. So they built air aircraft carriers instead. And those are the six aircraft carriers that they assembled with this ta task force, which was called the First Air Fleet. Uh, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, Huryu, Shikaku, and Zukaku. And uh, they left Japan uh, sometime in uh, late November and sailed up into the um, northern Pacific uh, to try to avoid uh, normal ship ship traffic. Uh, basically, then came down from the north uh, to, of course, attack Hawaii. Uh, and so the attack on Pearl Harbor took place on Sunday, Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Uh, the Americans, of course, their, you know, their ships, of course, and, and bases and all that were caught off guard. We were caught off guard. Uh, and uh, we weren't expecting, you know, war with Japan uh, at the time. I think we were more worried about the Germans or somebody else uh, fighting us uh, at that time. And, of course, the um, Japanese uh, aircraft carriers launched two waves of attack planes that included uh, bombers, torpedo bombers, fighters. Uh, at Basically, uh, Oahu's uh, main um, air bases that were on the island, they also attacked the Pacific Fleet. Uh, at Pearl Harbor as well. And what you can see there, the main emphasis, of course, was to go for uh, Battleship Row. Uh, and um, the Japanese realized, by the way, that it was total surprise. That, you know, we, we, they, they caught us with our bridges down. You know about that. And uh, the Japanese even sent, a, sent back a message saying that it was total surprise, which was Tora, 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 which meant Japanese, tiger, tiger, tiger. Uh, and um, anyway, um, when the when they we, when the uh, Japanese started attacking us, most of the uh, like sailors and soldiers thought it was a drill because you know it's Sunday morning. Why would they attack on Sun? Why would anything happen on Sunday morning? 
Uh, and so they sent out a, um, a message to everybody uh, telling that it wasn't a drill. This is no drill. They said, actually, this is no shit is what they really said. They, they actually said that. This is no shit. This is no drill. Um, and so uh, anyway, um, the um, what happened was the Japanese, of course, if you know about it, went after uh, the main fleet, of course, that was at Pearl Harbor. And they had, if you know about it, the so-called um, battleship row, if they called it at Pearl, Pearl Harbor, uh, where the main Pacific fleet's capital ships or battleships were, uh, basically. But you can see them there right here. Uh, in that picture right here, like California, Maryland, Oklahoma, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arizona, Nevada. Those are pretty much the main capital ships that they targeted the most. And then other ships that were also there that were in Pearl Harbor at the time. Uh, they also were hoping to take out our aircraft carriers uh, also as well. Uh, but they were actually doing naval drills to the west of Hawaii. So we got really lucky uh, with that. Uh, and so um, and, uh, in the attack, by the way, um, which came, like I said, two waves. They're supposed to have a third wave, but they quit. Um, but uh, in basically in the two waves, uh, they were able to damage or destroy 18 ships. I think 14, 14 uh, battleships were actually destroyed. Uh, with the two most, of course, that were destroyed the most was the USS Arizona. It was totally obliterated uh, with 80% loss of life uh, on it. USS Oklahoma was also sunk as well and actually turned over, turned turtle uh, with its keel facing up. Uh, and about 2,400 men were actually killed in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and uh, if you go to some of these pictures I've got, uh, here, here, of course, you can see the deployment of the um, Japanese attack waves that came in, uh, of course, from the north. Uh, they think the first wave came in maybe right before 8 a.m. Uh, the second wave came in right before 9 a.m., which you can see. So you can see they went after the airfields, and they also went after Pearl Harbor. So it's pretty much their main targets that were there. Do have some old pictures. It's actually a picture that was taken by one of the pilots on one of the attacking Japanese planes. Can you believe it? I think that's Battleship Row you're looking at, which is right here uh, in the picture. It's amazing seeing that, uh, which is right there. That's a picture of the USS Arizona blowing up. It's actually colorized because it was originally in black and white color, but that's what it looked like uh, when it blew up. And um, there's a joke that they think a bomb went down the smokestack, but that's just a made-up story. Uh, the bomb, one of the bombs they think hit the magazine. They keep like the gunpowder and stuff. And it blew up, basically. It actually sent material and not even debris and men in the air. Uh, and um, I think about 80% of the men that were on board the Arizona were killed, uh, which is really tragic. Uh, and um, I don't know if you know much about the USS Kidd, uh, which is in Baton Rouge. It's named after, and they say Captain Kidd, but it's actually named after uh, Isaac Kidd, uh, who was a rear admiral uh, in the U.S. Navy. He was on the Arizona when it blew up, and he was killed. And so the U.S.'s Kidd got named after him. That's the reason for it. That's why they wanted it so bad, because of you know, associated with the war. Uh, and, and I guess that, too, as well. Um, U.S.'s Arizona burning, of course. Uh, there it is right there. It actually burned till December like the end of December, like Christmas time, it was still on fire. Uh, they removed most of the top of it. And now, now it's, of course, the USS, um, USS Arizona Memorial, which is still there. And it's still actually leaking oil from the actual ship. That's the Maryland and Oklahoma. You can see the Maryland's, I think, over here uh, damaged. And then you've got the, um, that's the Oklahoma, which is turned turtle, uh, turned upside down. Uh, basically, they actually had men that were trapped inside that couldn't get out. They actually had guys that were trying to use welding material to cut holes in the hole to get people out. I think by the time they got to them, they were dead. So the most of the two main ships where people got killed were the Arizona and Oklahoma overall. 
Oh, that's another ship, the USS Shaw, which was in, I think, dry dock. Nobody was on the ship, but it blew up into a fireball, uh, which is amazing. So basically, because of the fact that Japan uh, attacked us, you know, on, on that date, um, basically, uh, the United States, of course, declared war on the Japanese on the next day, which would be, of course, on December, December the 8th. You know, we, we declared war uh, on them. Uh, the Japanese actually had been trying to declare war on us. Uh, they said it had something to do with translation issues between, you know, Japanese to American, but they think that the Japanese stalled trying to say that they were going to attack us uh, and declare war on us. Uh, and so by the time we got the message, it was too late. Uh, you know, Japan had already attacked attacked Pearl Harbor uh, and all that. So we, we thought that the whole thing, you know, was a total sneak attack on us uh, for what they did, uh, basically. And um, the United States, of course, declared, like I said, declared war on December 8th, uh, 1941. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, of course, would be famous for giving his Day of inf Infamy speech, uh, denouncing the dastardly attack, which he called it. Oh, I do have video of that, which I'll show you uh, at the end about the attack on Pearl Harbor, you know, the actual speech he gives, which is probably one of the greatest speeches that FDR gave. I know we think of that other speech he gave, which was about the Great Depression, about fear, but that, that's really considered his greatest speech uh, that he ever gave. And uh, if you know about uh, FDR, FDR is controversial because uh, he he did, if you know about it, started rounding up Japanese Americans right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, there was a fear uh, that the Japanese were going to invade Hawaii, invade California. Uh, and um, there's a great movie about that if you ever want to watch it called 1941. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a Steven Spielberg movie, but it kind of talks about the paranoia. Uh, that occurred like in California uh, at, right after the war broke out. They thought the Japanese were going to come in and take over. Uh, and so people were really jittery, you know, about it. And so uh, FDR passed this executive order called 9066. Uh, and what it did was it put Japanese Americans in, in internment camps um, all over the country. Uh, and it's kind of a sad story you know, about that. It's kind of like putting people in concentration camps almost. But um, but I guess there was a fear that they were going to do something and give information to the enemy. They I guess they didn't trust him or whatever. But it's one of the, the sad sides of that, of course, that happened when the war broke out. Of course, after we declared war on Japan, immediately uh, the Axis powers, the Germans and the Italians, they turned around and they declared war on the United States on December 11th. So now we're at war with basically all the major powers of the Axis powers, uh, Japan, Germany, and Italy. And so we end up having to fight this two-front war uh, in Europe, North Africa, and also in the Pacific. However, I'll get to it later. FDR is really more concerned about the Germans, uh, you know, because Germany is really more of a threat uh, than anything overall. And so FDR puts this Germany first idea together, uh, which is to try to put most of our forces in North Africa and Europe to try and defeat fascism over there first, and then try to finish off the Japanese later. That's pretty much our plan, uh, you know, uh, in the war. Uh, and um, I guess maybe they thought maybe that Germany fell, that Japan would fall, because they're all part of the so-called Axis power. So I'll get to it later, but they'll, they'll concentrate on trying to uh, get, um, you know, um, to knock those powers out of the war. So next time I'll, 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 I'll probably try to get into uh, and get more uh, into um, what happens in the rest of the war up to 1945. Let me go ahead and show you that video clip, though, uh, from Franklin D. Roosevelt course, from the Day of Infamy speech. Like I said, one of his greatest speeches that he ever, of course, gave uh, as President of the United States, uh, given on December 8th, uh, 1945. I think I have pretty much the whole full speech for you. All right, a little short little, uh, of course, uh, speech from FDR. So FDR, of course, um, you know, um, 
you know, it's really its greatest speech of, of all time, probably, I think, more or less. So now we're now we're pretty much in the war uh, at that point uh, overall. Um, I've got a few minutes left. Looks like I might just talk for a few minutes about what happened after the war. Now, we did we did get involved uh, in some of the um, conflicts, of course, uh, after after Pearl Harbor. Um, it took us a while for the United States to really get involved uh, in the war. We were, of course, involved in some early conflicts, mostly like in North Africa first. That was really our first thing that we really did uh, in the war. And um, like um, one of the first things we did was that we, of course, got into what we call Operation Torch. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but that was really our first major um event really where we got directly involved in World War II, at least in the European theater, uh, more or less. And uh, Allied forces were brought into North Africa to try to help neutralize the Axis powers who were trying to take over North Africa. I'll kind of get into um, a little bit about Erwin Rommel, but Erwin Rommel had been sent by Hitler to take over North Africa. And so... Um, they had what they call Operation Torch. And it was basically this allied invasion of what they call Vichy France. I think I've got a map showing you of pictures of it right here, of Vichy France. Uh, but um, we went in there. Vichy Fran the Vichy French were basically allies of the Axis powers um, in the war. Uh, they had kind of stayed on the uh, uh, German side. And... Um, we were trying to take back Morocco and Algeria, uh, which is obviously French territory, uh, but the Vichy French were more in support of Hitler and all that. And it took place in November 1942. Uh, American forces were led by Dwight D. Eisenhower, who they call Ike, uh, and also under him was the great general George S. Patton, uh, who they call Old, Bl Old Blood and Guts. And um, the Vichy forces that were on... Morocco and Algeria, they actually at first fired at us, but then they realized that looked like the Germans weren't doing so well at this point in the war. Looked like they're starting to lose the Germans. And so the uh, French side switched back to us, to the Allied side. And so the Americans were able to basically take Morocco and Algeria back. And so that was important because the Americans helped basically defeat uh, Urban Rommel's forces. Here's another map showing you them going in to take those two areas, uh, which were right there. And um, Rommel's Africa Corps, who you may have heard of, had been trying to take over North Africa. They even tried to seize uh, Egypt in 1942, but the British defeated them. And so they were kind of reeling and pushing westward into Tunisia. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, we were able to help the British encircle uh, Ramos' forces uh, in Tunisia and drive him out and drive the Nazis out of, of course, North Africa. So that was initially our first thing that we did uh, in the war. Uh, and then they also had Operation Husky, uh, which you may have heard of, which we were all second thing we were kind of involved in uh, later. Operation Husky was where uh, the American British forces uh, under Patton and also Bernard Montgomery, Monty of the British, uh, invaded Sicily, which was part of southern Italy. And uh, in this conflict, we were trying to drive the German forces and the Italian forces that, that basically occupied Italy, uh, the ones that were, uh, you know, Axis powers, the fascists. And uh, it took us about a month in July of 1943, but we eventually drove out uh, the, the German and Italian forces that were on the island of Sicily and forced Mussolini to step down as prime minister. He actually resigned in 1943. Uh, he would be later shot at the end of the war, 1945. And uh, Italy at that point realized that the Germans were losing too, and so Italy switched to the Allied side as well. They switched over. Uh, however, Hitler kept fighting, you know, about this uh, in Italy. Uh, and um, the so-called Italian campaign would last for about two years almost uh, in 1943-45. And the Allies struggled to take Italy because 
Uh, the Allies had this idea that Churchill came up with, which was to try and invade uh, Southern Europe, like Austria, Germany, uh, by going through Italy, like going up through the Italian peninsula. But the Germans stopped them cold a lot, uh, using fortifications along the mountains of Italy. And so it was a very, very tough, tough conflict. Uh, sometimes they, they call the Italian campaign the um, Forgotten War, because uh, we started fighting in Europe like D-Day and all that, and people forgot about uh, what was going on there. And uh, probably the most famous battles associated with the United States that we fought in were the battles of Monte Cassino, the Battle of Anzio, which took place in 19, really 44. It's actually, it's actually yeah, 1944, I think is when it is, not 43. And um, those battles were important in taking um, what is um, – the capital of Rome, uh, of course, in Italy. And we would take that on June 4th, 1944. Uh, it would be like the first actual Axis powers capital to fall uh, to the Allied powers in the war. But Italy, like I said, it was a very bloody campaign. We had Two million people killed in the war on both sides combined. And it would take almost to like May of 1945 for the Allies to get up into the northern part of Italy where the Alps is. I don't think we even conquered all of Italy before the war was, was over at that point. So that's like initially we did in Europe. Uh, of course, Mussolini ended up dead uh, at the end of the war. But uh, I'm going to talk about it later. I'm going to get more later into what happens because, uh, of course, the United States is going to get kind of the D-Day invasion where we go into France. Uh, we help take, take out the Germans. Uh, I'll also talk about uh, how – uh, in the Pacific, we have to, of course, defeat the Japanese. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the end of the war uh, next week. Uh, of course, getting into the like the atomic bomb, how we developed that. Uh, and of course, that leads into the Cold War, which is probably something we'll be start talking about soon, also as well um, next week as well. So that's it for today of uh, this lecture. Uh, I'll have a part two lecture next week, next Tuesday, of course on World War II. I'm going to wrap that up. So that's it. I uh, did want to remind you, don't forget, uh, you do have various assignments uh, that are that are still up. Uh, don't forget about those. Uh, I think you've got that one of World War I. Uh, you got to wrap up, which I told you, I, I think I've given you till Saturday to complete it, uh, to get that done uh, right now. And then, of course, don't forget, you can start working on your second exam, which that's going to be due of course, at the end of next week. Uh, of course, after this lecture, after I stream it, I am going to, of course, post it to my YouTube channel. Um, so let me know if you have any questions, of course, about this lecture, comments, questions, whatever you want. Um, and that's it for today. So I hope you have a good weekend coming up. Oh, I got happy Halloween coming up. I'm already, I'm already dressed up too, you know, <laughs> kind of, sort of. All right, so y'all take care. Have a great weekend.